I'm director of the IEO. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this IEO seminar uh, on our latest evaluation on the IMF's engagement with small developing states, or SDS as we as we call them, which was discussed by the board last month. Uh, these countries may be individually small, but together there there are 34 SDS, and they represent almost 20% of the IMF's membership. Moreover, as we emphasized in the evaluation, IMF engagement with these members poses a number of special challenges. Many face distinctive vulnerabilities related to natural disasters and climate change, as well as typically having limited institutional capacity and, and very narrow economic basis. The fund can play really a, a crucial role for these countries as a unique source of authoritative macroeconomic policy advice and, and valuable source of external financing. Uh, but doing so requires recognizing, recognizing these countries' special needs and, and characteristics. We're very fortunate today to have an excellent lineup of speakers to discuss how the fund has helped SDS and what more it may be able to do to strengthen its impact further. First of all, Cyrus Rostomji, uh, who led the IO evaluation, will present the evaluation's findings and recommendations and discuss its reception of the board and, and the follow up that uh, is now just getting underway. Cyrus knows small states' issues very well, uh, including through his previous role before he joined the IEO when he was Director of Economic Affairs at the Commonwealth, which includes 32 small states members. Then we will have three panelists. I'll turn first to Ian Durant, who is Director of the Economics Department at the Caribbean Development Bank, and will provide a country perspective from the Caribbean. Next will be Philip Jennings, who is Chair of the IMF Executive Board's Small States Working Group, and is Executive Director representing nine small states at the fund, as well as Canada, after many years working in the Canadian government. And then finally, we will turn to Uma Ramakrishnan, who is Deputy Director in the IMF's Strategy Policy and Review Department with responsibility for small stakes work as, as well as non-concessional lending. She has herself worked directly on many small states in earlier stages of her fund career. After that, I'll open the floor to Q&A from the audience, and we have until two o'clock, so there should be plenty of time for discussion. Uh, before I turn to Cyrus, let me mention a few ground rules. As you heard, the session is being recorded uh, and we'll make the recording available shortly after the seminar ends. Uh, I'd like to ask that all participants uh, in this call keep their microphones on mute until invited to speak. Uh, and please send questions in the chat box uh, for the subsequent uh, Q&A and discussion. Let me now turn to Cyrus. Cyrus, please. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I hope it is coming through. <clears throat> um, is it is it coming through okay? Yeah. Okay, so um, welcome colleagues and thank you for coming to this presentation. I'm gonna try to quickly go through a snapshot of what we found in our evaluation, what recommendations we had, um, the reactions, that came uh, from the process um, of the evaluation. I'm not sure, yes, but th this is working now on my side as well. Um, so let me uh, briefly mention that evaluations are done in teams at the IO. Uh, I happen to be the leader of this particular team, but you see on the screen, uh, all of the colleagues that participated, an uh, internal team, many external consultants together collectively our colleagues have put this evaluation together um, the uh, um, I'm sorry my system doesn't seem to be working too well um, okay I'll just keep on rolling so I'd like to cover briefly the motivation for the evaluation, some findings, the recommendations, and as I say, the reactions that came from it, and what are some of the next steps uh, following the 
conclusion of the of the evaluation itself. Uh, firstly, um, we have um, uh, thirty four small states members in the fund. Uh, they are classified as small states members, countries with populations of a million and a half or under, and they exclude advanced economies and high income fuel exporting countries. Unfortunately, my my system doesn't want to work in, oh, there we go. So you see here in this uh, shorter uh, rectangle, this one that I'm circling, these are the 34 small states members in the fund. They distributed across the five fund regions. Um, and in our evaluation, we did country studies on 15 of them. You can see the, the countries that are highlighted there. Uh, the others are World Bank, Classified as World Bank members, these are the ones that are either advanced economies or fuel exporters. Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with my my presentation today. I wonder if somebody in the office could come and help me because it's not wanting to pick up. Oh boy. Are you here? No. Okay. I'm sorry. It, it, it's well. Thank you very much. Forgive me. Okay, so small states uh, are heterogeneous, but they share many important characteristics. Um, one of the key reasons why we wanted to look at this group of countries for the evaluation, narrow production bases, limited economic diversification, and a range of economic characteristics. They're also extremely vulnerable to natural disasters and climate change. You see a little chart here showing how, as the incidence of natural disasters uh, progresses and as the share of damages increases, small states are much more susceptible to these large natural disasters. Uh, across the world over the evaluation period when disasters of 30% or more of GDP occurred, 70% of them took place in small states. So they're very vulnerable to this uh, particular challenge. They also acutely human resource constraints and lack institutional resources, and they suffer from many social and political economy issues, particularly acute unemployment, brain drain, instability, and so on. Um, all of these pose particular challenges for the fund. The microeconomic issues that they struggle with are sometimes outside the core expertise of the fund. The capacity constraints that they face limit their ability to take up policy advice, often very good policy advice by the fund, but limited ability to take it up. They have particularly acute financing needs associated with large sudden shocks, particularly natural disasters, and in building long-term resilience to natural disasters also quite hard to staff teams to work on small states, both for um, in, internal issues. The fund has of a broad membership, many large countries. There are incentives and important um, career prospects for member countries working on larger countries. And it's quite difficult work in small states. So there are challenges for the staff that do work on these. Five clusters of findings from the evaluation. The first on the overall progress that we discerned looking at the period 2010 to 2020. Um, clear cut finding that the fund deserves credit for substantially stepping up its engagement over the evaluation period. We really found this quite early as we went started off with our evaluation work. The fund has done a tremendous amount of work in these member countries, wanted to make sure that this is well credited and acknowledged in the evaluation. Particular elements, there was specific guidance provided to staff on what SDS work in two occasions, uh, staff guidance notes, 2014 and 2017. There was increased attention to climate change and natural disaster issues in many ways through the research agenda, through the crafting of um, uh, diagnostic tools, uh, through uh, the facilities of the fund, and particularly rising from 2016 onwards, very important papers on building resilience to natural disasters in, in, in small states and more broadly, and then the introduction in 2017 of a large natural disaster window, which was particularly useful for small states. 
Over the period, the fund also augmented capacity to provide emergency financing following a natural disaster, both general increases in access, but also, as I say, particularly attuned to the circumstances introduction of a large natural disaster. Capacity resources um, or resources for capacity development were augmented and the RCD, Regional Capacity Development Centers, played a really critical role and played an outstanding role, frankly, in um, augmenting and sustaining engagement with small states. Finally, we saw a commitment by board members, management teams and staff to support small states throughout the evaluation period. Sometimes it ebbed and flowed, but it was there consistently and, and quite powerfully. In terms of surveillance, we found that policy advice was generally appreciated, high quality advice it was well tailored generally. At the same time, in some cases, there was a lack of actionability and specificity in policy advice, particularly for these types of countries where issues are macro relevant to them, but they may not be outside of the fund's core competence. Where tools were useful, like the FSAPs, CCPAs, also the DRS uh, tool, um, the access to these tended to be limited. And that was pro pro quite frustrating for policymakers who understood that in a number of other countries, small states um, and elsewhere, these tools were available, but um, they weren't being <coughs> spread across the small states membership. The, Frequency and engagement was low. This is largely to do with the, um, the Article 4 cycle, number of countries on 24 month cycle. And there was a lack of continuity in con country teams. This, all of this hampered the trusted advisor role that the fund can have. Uh, and it, it changed the dynamic of the relationship with members um, in, in, in these countries. Um, there were challenges in meeting standard surveillance requirements. Many of these were due to institutional constraints in the member countries, also uh, limited data, uh, and the challenge of spending a lot of time just simply developing the core data to be able to conduct standards. And also some of the diagnostic tools were quite complex. And, uh, some member countries struggled with some of these. All in all, the consequence of that was the traction tended to be uneven surveillance. In programs and lending, the fund has been useful to small states facing natural disasters and facing the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But at the same time, we found that the lending framework wasn't particularly well suited to these member countries. In the context of programs with conditionality relative to, to other members, um, uh, just we find that the uh, share of DRA outstanding uh, of outstanding credit to um, members as a share of quota, both in GRA and PRGT lending, tended to be consistently lower across the evaluation period for small states. Uh, and this was this was a somewhat puzzling and and, and challenging because many of these countries could. Gained tremendously from programs, and where programs were present, we found that there were good results. The programs tended to work well in small states where they took, they were uh, generally infrequent. Number of reasons why there was uh, little use of programs: stigma, low access levels relative to the scale of need. Recall that these are members with very very small quotas. Um, also, considerable challenges for institutions that already severely challenge to enter into uh, program engagement and to sustain it. And the short time frames relative to the longer term needs of these member countries. And here we just draw, I'd like to just draw attention to the, the advent now of the RST Resilience and Sustainability Trust. It provides a huge opportunity to address this, uh, this issue of the short time frame and relative to longer term needs challenge we found over the 2010 to 2020 uh, period. Now, even with IMF emergency financing, including during the COVID pandemic, access levels we found uh, tended to be low compared to the, the scale of, of financing. Again, not. Okay, so you see here in this little chart that uh, the financing gaps in small states as a share of GDP were much larger than for other countries. And when the fund 
um, contributed, which was very valuably received and, and appreciated by the membership, but it tended to be a relatively small share of the financing gap filled by funding sources. Um, in terms of our findings and capacity development, really this is a very much a good news story. CD represented a higher share of IMF activity than for other countries. We see in this little chart that in this column here, the green share, the capacity development was larger than for any other country group. It's very, very much appreciated by the members. Uh, they found it to be of good quality. Content was right. Uh, it was sufficiently tailored to country circumstances. As I mentioned, the RCDCs were a key driver of the success of the fund capacity development. Also, they provided other benefits in terms of particularly continuity of engagement, especially for members in the Pacific where travel is complex and difficult, uh, and the, many are on Article 4, 24 month cycles. Main concerns with CD were that traction in and impact were uneven due to, as I mentioned, limited absorptive capacity of recipients and a tendency sometimes in staff advice to focus on first best solutions not always recognizing the limitations to absorption in member countries. One risk we um, picked up was that, that to some extent that CD support could be too reliant on sustained uh, external finance. Um, then a final finding cluster around HR management, internal HR management. So in general, staff working on fund on small states are really very much appreciated and valued. Our interviews showed very powerfully that uh, they're highly regarded as skilled, considered to be skilled staff uh, with good experience and knowledge when they spend sufficient time in small states to contribute, and their work is appreciated. At the same time, found through looking at uh, examples of the staff participation in Article 4 missions, that uh, the work has been adversely affected. There's been high turnover, short tenure of staff, the institutional incentives have tended to be poor. Um, there's ratings, performance ratings and promotion rates tended to be lower uh, among economists working on small staff than other country groups. And the small, the, the team sizes tended to be small and access to specialist skill sets was limited. Particularly, we found that limited use of the staff from functional departments traveling on article formations. Um, and very few uh, uh, res reps and res rep officers. In fact, of over 70 res rep officers, there's only one that's located in the small states. So we, in our evaluation, we did find that it's a challenge. In terms of turnover of mission chiefs, this little chart illustrates the extent to which this was a, a challenge. There were 154 mission chiefs over the uh, decade of the evaluation. Um, you can see the, the extent to which those mission chiefs, so just over 100 of them only attended one Article 4 mission, just about 40 attended two, and very, very few attended more than that. Um, what about our recommendations? We had four broad recommendations. The first was about the framework for engagement. Our recommendation is that the fund should pursue a targeted recalibration of its overall approach for engagement with small states, to strengthen the value added and the impact of its work. And the calibration is intended to recognize very clearly that the fund has done and has embarked on a strong journey of engagement with small states. And it's a matter of recalibrating this effort and targeting this. We had a number of underpinning suggestions for this, refreshing the guidance that has been provided, and also it, um, bolstering the internal coordination mechanisms that can support continuity and accountability, and the momentum that's been created around work on this. Second recommendation uh, is oriented to strengthening the focus and traction of fund work recommend steps be taken at the operational level to enhance the focus and traction in areas of surveillance and CD. And again, four underlying broad suggestions. Greater selective attention to policy issues that are macro critical in small states. This was a consistent challenge 
uh, we found in, in our in our country studies and in interviews with staff that uh, more focus on these issues that are macrocritical to these members, whereas they may not necessarily be perceived as, as in that way for, for larger countries. More tailored strategies to engage with members to foster in, uh, the impact and integration of the funds working with members. More efforts to apply these diagnostic tools that I mentioned in a manner that's more suitable to these uh, member country circumstances. And a higher focus, more focus on CD support on institutional capacity constraints. A third area of recommendations focus on the lending framework. We felt looking at the application of both program and, and emergency financing in a small states context, uh, that something could be done here. We feel that the fund should consider how to use the lending framework in ways that better address the needs and vulnerabilities of small states. And we had three underlying suggestions there. Again, as I mentioned, the RST is a good opportunity to take forward some of the challenges that we picked up. Uh, we feel that the, the lending programs uh, ought to allocate more attention to growth and resilience outcomes in programs. Um, and we had a suggestion to increase access limits under the large natural disaster window of the emergency financing instruments, not all of them, just the one where member countries are hit by large natural disasters, these are disasters of a scale of 20% of GDP or more. Uh, the access limits should in, if essentially be recommended a re restoration to the pandemic level of the uh, of the access limits for this uh, this window. Those limits were pared down as the pandemic uh, impact started to wane, and we recommended, given the vulnerability of these members to large natural disasters, uh, that this sustained at the high at the, at the pandemic level. A final recommendation is about enhancing HR management. We recommend that the fund adopt further HR management and budgetary commitments to increase the continuity and impact of the staff's engagement with SDS. Again, building on the very good perception of work that is done by staff in uh, small states and uh, recognizing the effort that has been made and continues to be made by staff working on small states, but building further on this and enhancing it. We recommend three uh, suggestions to, to give effect to this. Greater departmental commitment to reducing the staff turn uh, the turnover of the staff and avoiding gaps in assignments we picked up Looking at the, I guess it was over 200 article formations, there were considerable gaps in the period between the end of a, one mission chief assignment and the start of another. This is um, can be dreadful for the continuity of the engagement for members in small states because they rely so heavily on fund policy advice and continuity of engagement with, with the fund, um, particularly so in small states and particularly so among those that are remote or, where um, the funds present isn't always strongly uh, evergreen or always there. Um, we also uh, suggested strengthening incentives by, as, as we mentioned here, increasing recognition of the work that staff do on small states, internal recognition of this, limiting the use of the co-desk assignments where one person is assigned to more than one desk assignment sometimes to a larger country and not a small state. More use of the technical and expertise of skills of the functional department staff and more research assistance. And phasing out what we call stopgap measures. This is where a mission quickly needs to be assembled. Uh, there aren't staff um, readily available to do this. And sometimes um, area department is obliged to draw on staff from other other areas of the fund. We find that this this doesn't um, contribute to strengthening the relationship with the with the membership and the membership themselves in the institute were telling us we don't like it so much. A final one is additional budgetary resources to be provided to expand the footprint of the fund in small states. And particularly we honed in on the uh, greater use of uh, regional resident offices and uh, bolstering the the support provided to RCDCs. 
what about the reactions? There are two sets of reactions, as they as there always are with IEO evaluations. The one a set of reactions is contained in the statement issued by the managing director. Managing director statement agreed that a targeted recalibration would be effective to enhance the traction of the funds engagement. And the statement offered qualified and and or partial support to all of the four recommendations. The statement also re raised concerns about budgetary constraints, compatibility with the IMF legal framework, uh, and particularly, I think, in the context of lending, um, uh, and also strategic plans and overlap with other ongoing initiatives. Uh, these are initiatives that are in response to other, particularly in response to other I IEO evaluations where steps are being taken to address action plans other evaluations where they may be overlapped with some of the recommendations included. The board, the board discussed in May the um, recommendations. The board welcomed the finding that the fund engagement has substantially stepped up and agreed that a major overhaul is not required in the engagement. Many directors, including those representing small states, offered broad support for all four general recommendations and most of the specific suggestions. Other directors, many other directors, agreed with the MDS statement as providing a broadly balanced approach. Next steps, and particularly for um, colleagues who've joined who may not be familiar with the way the IEO evaluations proceed once the evaluations are, are done. But within six months of a board discussion, as mentioned, now concluded in May, the staff of the of the fund prepare a management implementation plan in response to the recommendations that are endorsed by the board. This implementation plan, we call it MIP, will translate into board endorsed recommendations. Will translate these into concrete actions with a time frame for implementation, and assign the various departmental responsibilities for implementation. It then goes to the evaluation committee of the board for a discussion and must eventually be approved by the board. Once the board has approved it, implementation is monitored annually together with all of our other management implementation plans, including all of those that the, the IEO has, has done evaluations, which there are ongoing implementation plans by the IMF's audit, internal audit um, office. I think I've covered everything. I'm happy to answer any questions. Sorry about the glitches in the presentation. A little early. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Cyrus. You've very skillfully summarized a, a wealth of rich material that, that's covered in the in the evaluation and the and, and the many background papers. And, and I do encourage people who are interested uh, to visit uh, the IO website, where the full set of reports and background papers are are, are available. Um, now, let me turn to our th three panelists, um, and we'll start with Ian Durant, uh, Director of the Economics Department at the Caribbean Development Bank. Uh, Ian, uh, very much looking forward to hearing your comments. Ready? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night uh, to panelists and those participating online. Uh, first of all, let me thank the IMF um, Office of Independent Evaluation for inviting us to participate in this very, very important uh, discussion. And let me thank uh, Cyrus for a good presentation and 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 for a really useful a really useful report. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to just, for context, identify the relevant challenges in, in small developing states, specifically in the Caribbean. Um, well, the Caribbean development banks, borrowing member countries. And then I'm going to identify some policy imperatives to basically create a context for uh, what I do later, which is pretty much to reiterate uh, what the IMF uh, is doing well, uh, but also to add some uh, recommendations, uh, some additional considerations, uh, you know, which we think are important uh, 
given the particular context that we'll identify. And of course, what I'll do is that I'm going to map those thoughts onto the four recommendations that were that were made. So, uh, just by way of information, the IMF SDS group includes 12 of CDB's 19 uh, boring member countries, uh, and those are list listed there on the left of the slide. Uh, the other CDB BMCs are listed on the right, and those include Haiti, Jamaica, and uh, the British Overseas Territories. Uh, what has been pretty obvious for us uh, over, certainly over the last two decades, and this is also mentioned in the report, um, growth has been in the, in among Caribbean BMCs has been much lower than it was uh, among um, other small states, and by other small states, I'm using not the SDS group, but the UN, U, the UN definition. Um, prior to the the uh, the Great Recession, regional growth averaged 3.5 percent, while in other SIDS, the average was 5.3 percent. Following the crisis, regional growth slowed to point. Uh, 0.9% or thereabouts, while other SIDS average 4.3%. And removing Guyana, of course, you're aware that, that uh, Guyana has been growing rapidly, certainly in the last few years, as a result of um, oil uh, discovery. Removing um, Guyana, what we see is that regional GDP is not expected to recover to pre-COVID levels uh, by the end of this year. And this is after uh, it took four years on average for countries to recover from the Great Recession. So growth is a fundamental challenge. Low growth is a fundamental challenge um, in the in the region. Um, so, but the reasons for the the slow growth and the acute vulnerability to shocks are listed here. Uh, as far as we are concerned, first of all, you have a uh, high export concentration, which really reflects a lack of competitiveness and uh, uh, creates starts and stops when the single, in many cases, main export uh, is affected by some external shock or some natural hazard event. And of course, the other thing is that the region is highly susceptible uh, to natural hazard events, regarded as the the most vulnerable region in the world. High indebtedness is another challenge, and it really limits expenditures on development projects and creates uncertainty among investors, and pretty much raises financing costs for these small economies, these small vulnerable economies. And although the average debt to GDP ratio has fallen after peaking in 2020, it was still high at the end of uh, 2021 at 80.3%. Uh, the other challenge is limited implementation capacity, which really lengthens the implementation period of um, critical projects and really delays impacts. So those those challenges, those uh, challenges really uh, present us with some important um, policy imperatives, and those policy imperatives provides, if you like, the context for some of the additional thoughts that um, that I'm going to add later. But what are the the policy imperatives really for for addressing these challenges uh, with respect to strengthening implementation capacity? Um, really, we have to focus on capacity development. I know that that figured very prominently in, in the report. Um, there's also a need to improve delivery systems to make sure that there's accountability for moving uh, on, the, on the, the key milestones in project implementation. 
uh, as well as the, the provision of implementation support through things like technical assistance and initiatives such as project implementation units. Uh, improving competitiveness through upgraded infrastructure and improvements in the regulatory and institutional framework within which entrepreneurs operate. That's, that's, that's critical as well. Uh, one of the other imperatives is reducing the susceptibility to natural hazard events by basically climate proofing uh, infrastructure, uh, implementing efficient disaster risk management systems, and strengthening the legal and institutional framework for risk reduction. And uh, with respect to addressing debt overhang, uh, in essence, improving access to concessional resources to better align the cost of capital with GDP growth. I'm sure that you can well appreciate that in situations where countries have um, heightened risk uh, and are therefore uh, paying interest rates, interest costs that are about 6%, 7%, uh, 8% in, in many cases, if countries are growing at 2 3% in, in nominal terms, then what you have done is pretty much built in uh, adversity into your autonomous debt dynamics. So it is, it is critical. That is one critical component of uh, addressing um, indebtedness. Of course, it's also important to ensure that uh, your, your, your macroeconomic policy is uh, sustainable, that you're getting uh, as much as you can out of your revenue with respect to economic efficiency, uh, revenue sufficiency, um, uh, equity, and simplicity. Uh, so these things are all critical. And I don't want to say that any one is more important than the other because it's really about uh, being comprehensive in the approach to addressing these growth challenges, these growth and development challenges. Now, turning now to, uh, you know, the IMF and the experience, if you like, in, um, you know, um, in small, the small economies in the Caribbean, I think perhaps the most important achievement is the trust that the IMF has built among the SDSs in the region. And this has improved significantly over, over the years. Um, this contrasts really with, with, with the perception that existed uh, maybe in the, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, connected to the building of trust is the level of responsiveness that the fund has demonstrated to, to, to various crises that have confronted the small states in the region, um, you know, including uh, COVID responses, uh, the rapid credit facilities, and the expansion of uh, the increase in SDF in SDR, sorry, allocation. Uh, and the IMF has also moved beyond its traditional mandate of, of almost exclusively focusing on rebalancing uh, balance of payments to really understanding the challenges posed by uh, climate change and they've respond, responded in an appropriate fashion. Um, and I think that we'd want to admit that certainly in recent times programs, IMF supported programs in the region uh, have been largely successful and I can cite the, the, the examples of Barbados, um, even though Barbados is still in its embryonic stage and, and the gains have been, if you like, affected or interrupted by the COVID pandemic. Uh, Grenada uh, was in a very good position, and Jamaica were in very good positions to weather the headwinds of COVID as a result of the uh, fund programs that they began to implement around 2013 or thereabouts. Uh, the challenges facing MF engagement with SDSs included including um, the voices of uh, these, these countries. Uh, how do you continue to satisfy the SDSs uh, that their voices are not lost? Uh, and this, this I'm sure that we recognize that this has been a, a, a frequent complaint of late, especially as global issues uh, intensify and attention is shifted to large economies. Uh, equity, even as, as the IMF has demonstrated responsiveness to the needs of um, SDSs, 
I think the notion of equity would continue to be a challenge. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is that using all of that as a context, I'm going to map some thoughts onto the four recommendations that um, that Cyrus identified and that are included in the in the report. Um, I think that we'd want to appreciate that these structural and development issues are often the fundamental reason for underperformance and vulnerabilities, the, the issues that, that I identified earlier. And if we are going to address, if we are going to, to stop the cycle of starts and stops, then we're going to have to deal with the, the structural issues. And uh, the evidence suggests that these approaches have to be um, comprehensive. Piecemeal approaches are not going to uh, achieve the success that one is looking for with respect to making these countries resilient in all of their development aspects or dimensions. Um, so there needs to be really a systematic approach to collaboration with other development partners, really to design and implement initiatives to address growth and development challenges. So, so while we are addressing macroeconomic imbalances, we also have to keep our eye on uh, the structural challenges, the development challenges, the weakness with respect to broad resilience, whether it's economic resilience, environmental resilience, the institutional resilience. Um, uh, we have to make sure that we address these issues at the same time that we are addressing the short term in, in instances where there is rescue from a particular um, sudden onset event. You have to keep the, the entire timeline in mind. Yes, you have to address the, 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 the immediate challenges, but you have to ensure that you're, you're looking as well at the longer term uh, development challenges. And recognize, of course, that there are other development partners that have better place to address some of these structural and, and infrastructural uh, deficiencies. So uh, roads, ports, um, institutions related to trade facilitation, these, their, 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 their entities, CDB, World Bank, um, IDB, speaking for the Caribbean region, that are better placed uh, and there needs to be that sort of collaboration to ensure that we deal with, with, with the, the challenges in a comprehensive way to reduce the um, lack of resilience. And the analytical tools and knowledge products that take the unique characteristics and heterogeneity of the of SDSs into consideration is, is, is also necessary. These countries are different. And even among, even within the group, um, the countries themselves uh, have slightly different challenges and those things must be taken into account and they must be taken into account uh, via um, via tweaks to the analytical tools and, and uh, knowledge products. Uh, with respect to recommendation two, uh, enhancing surveillance and uh, capacity development, what I would what I want to add there is uh, the collaboration of development partners on country strategies to enhance complementarity and the HR base would be uh, would be useful. This is this is this is hinted at um, in the report, but if if we're going to if we're going to to ensure that we have a comprehensive approach uh, around which there is consensus, then the, the we have to we have to exchange notes on our strategies, right? Um, there's already that type of exchange among the NDBs, uh, certainly operating in the region, IDB, uh, World Bank, and the other development partners as well. Um, we tend to, to uh, exchange notes and ensure that there's complementarity and there's comprehensiveness in addressing the, 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 the challenges. Um, uh, there needs as well to be collaboration on, on country capacity development to 
really to build complementarity. So, so if if your if the fund is working on one area, um, the other areas uh, that will need to be addressed uh, that perhaps should be identified as part of a a, a comprehensive approach to addressing institutional uh, weaknesses and achieving institutional resilience, if if you like. Uh, and greater collaboration on knowledge products to ensure consensus building on the policy imperatives and the approaches. Uh, again, we're talking about pooling uh, resources, pooling knowledge, um, and, and ensuring that we are all working towards the same goal in, in lockstep with the countries. Uh, recommendation three, addressing the financing needs of um, small developing states, uh, partnerships on increasing access to concessional resources is critical. And again, uh, the issue of, of access, increasing access to concessional resources, I know has come uh, firmly into view uh, of the IMF. Uh, and of course, CDB, at CDB, we are developing a framework for determining access to concessional resources, and we're calling that the Recovery Duration Adjuster. Uh, it's really a, a, a framework that seeks to adjust um, gross national income as a, a basis for determining access to concessional resources uh, by taking into account resilience, vulnerability, and the duration of, of recovery. So the adjustment pretty much recognizes the probability of a shock uh, or, or a natural hazard event, the size of the impact and the duration of the impact. And what implication does that have for, let's say, uh, the sum of GNI over the next uh, 10, uh, 10 years? Uh, how, how does that compare with, with a situation where there's the absence of a shock? And then using that to pretty much adjust um, GNI to take a more realistic view of what really is the the the, the income of, of the country. Uh, and this this is intended to provide greater access to concessional resources and really improve that sustainability. I mentioned of course the importance of ensuring that countries have access to appropriately priced resources in a situation where the growth is low. Uh, and you want to make sure that the, 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 the price that countries are paying for loans is not significantly higher than the average growth rate that they're experiencing. Are experiencing. Otherwise, as I said, you are building adversity into those uh, autonomous debt dynamics and um, sort of building in uh, a debt. Uh, unsustainable uh, debt situation, if you like. So, so we believe that access to these to concessional resources is critical to addressing uh, debt sustainability. So with respect to recommendation four, uh, strengthening the the human resource commitment. Well, uh, we think that there's scope here to create a wider human resources ecosystem, basically by working closely with regional development partners. Uh, and collaborating on knowledge products and analytical tools is a little bit of, uh, in a sense, repetition, but it's a slight nuance, uh, uh, slight difference in the nuance. Uh, collaboration on knowledge products and analytical tools is, um, is going to be critical as well to sort of address what were identified as rapid turnover. If you broaden, obviously, if you broaden the HR ecosystem to include the other development partners uh, operating in the region, then you basically um, build uh, that knowledge retention into, into the, 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 the human resources that are pretty much serving uh, the region. So, so those are some things that that uh, I would add, and um, uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. It's very nicely laid out uh, set of points. Which I, I like the way you you then uh, bring out your perspectives on on both progress and also 
the recommendations and I, I noted your themes uh, of taking a comprehensive approach and strong collaboration with, with partners in the region, which I, I think resonates very well uh, with, with findings and recommendations in, in the evaluation. Uh, so thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, next, let's turn to Philip Jennings, uh, who is the chair of the executive board small states working group uh, and executive director representing nine of the small states uh, in the Caribbean as, as well as Canada. Uh, so, Philip, let me let me turn to you now. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Charles, and a good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, or I guess for some, for some, maybe it's a bit later than the afternoon. Uh, I am pleased to be part of this discussion. So I wanted to also start off by saying a thank you to IEO for inviting me to, uh, to this. Uh, I should note as well for those that don't know me that I am relatively new to the uh, to the IMF. So I joined. Uh, I started in February. So I uh, I will provide some comments from that reflection. But uh, the other panelists uh, have a lot more uh, experience. So uh, again, I'm just kind of. Uh, Providing my perspective, I do have a solid team, uh, and I am I have had some meetings of the uh, working group, uh, which has uh, informed some of the comments I'll make today. Uh, I also want to note at the outset that I I do feel privileged to share this panel with um, people like Mr. Durant, uh, who just spoke, who does bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to specific challenges facing small developing states, and in particular uh, Caribbean ones as well as Uma, who has been leading uh, on the important work to improve the fund's engagement uh, with small developing states and uh, has a very strong commitment to that goal. And obviously Cyrus, who's, who started off in terms of being quite instrumental in finalizing what, uh, in my view, is a very strong and comprehensive um, evaluation. Um, I do think that at this point in time, given the evaluation that took place and the board discussion uh, on small state engagement, that it is important to not lose the momentum that's been built uh, from, the, from that. And it's a point that I will thread throughout my comments and remarks is that the need to continue to make progress in supporting small developing states and to set a path to sustainable, resilient and inclusive economic growth. Um, I won't go, th I'll, I'll be brief in terms of, uh, Cyrus covered it quite well in terms of uh, small states and the characteristics. Uh, I'll just kind of repeat that, you know, from the perspective and discussions that have taken place at the working group is that the small states are for sure a, a heterogeneous group, but they do share very similar characteristics and vulnerabilities in some areas. Um, from small populations and economic bases to the exposure to the extreme impacts <laughs> both absolute and relative from external shocks related to natural disasters and climate change. These common characteristics create common challenges to macro stability and therefore fund engagement. Moreover, these external shocks are, pre are predicted to continue occurring with increased frequency and strength, not to mention the significant impacts of COVID pandemic and its scarring effects. I want to focus my comments today on four key opportunities for the fund to build upon its ongoing work and enhance engagement and impact within small developing states, recognizing, of course, that there are constraints on resources and there are trade-offs that are inherent with some of these choices. The first is on cohesion, continuity, and accountability. The second is staffing stability. The third is the importance of a fit-for-purpose lending toolkit. And finally, emerging challenges that require firm uh, the fund attention. On the first point, which has been a key driver for conducting the IEO evaluation to begin with, is the importance to have a, a picture of how the fund is doing in its engagement with small developing states. A picture that allows the fund to build on progress and improve where opportunities do exist. Now, the good news is, as Cyrus before me has noted, is the fund's engagement with small developing states has improved notably over the past decade. This should be commended, including the staff that are behind uh, this improvement. And I know my authorities recognize and appreciate the progress. The recognition of the vulnerabilities and coverage of small states is increasingly evident in surveillance activity. Similarity, capacity development continues to be improved and more tailored to suit the needs and challenges 
especially in the areas of climate. Our authorities value and rely on the fund technical assistance and the establishment of technical assistance centers in various regions have brought capacity development much closer to the intended beneficiaries. These are but a few examples of the fund responding to the needs of small states. Responsiveness, as Mr. Durant mentioned. I talked about uh, IEO evaluation as a picture. So a key question to ask is what mechanism is best to incentivize continued progress and accountability for outcomes from that commitment to continue making that progress. Whether it takes shape of a roadmap, a strategy, or a framework or a plan, what is key is that it promotes cohesion, effective coordination, and efficiency and collaboration. Essentially, a plan of follow-up actions is needed to align efforts to continue making progress and including a way to track achievements against that plan. It would also serve as a signaling um, of a, a clear message of the fund acknowledgement of small developing states as a group of countries that has unique challenges as well as significant vulnerabilities and that it has been intentional in its engagement with them. Another area where continuity and cohesion are important is in mission team staffing. There is much benefit to reap from mission chief, uh, team staff, including the mission chiefs spending sufficient time on a given country. Specifically, they gain a deeper understanding of its economy needs, as well as foster a better working relationship and establishment of trust. To avoid any misunderstandings, I should note um, that I'm not suggesting in any way that the work of the IMF staff in small developing states is anything less than high quality. What I am suggesting is that sufficient tenure does hold opportunity for even better outcomes. A solid understanding of countries and good relationships with authorities and stakeholders does translate into strengthened analysis, policy recommendations, and engagement relevant to the country. This was validated by country officials who noted in the evaluation, who noted that the quick rotation of IMS mission chiefs impedes trust and understanding. I, along with other small developing states executive directors, share firsthand experience of high mission chief turnover among constituent countries. And it was affirmed in the IEO um, survey that staff turnover is significantly a greater issue in these countries than it is in others. I recognize that many staff members enjoy working on small developing states. So additional measures to incentivize their work and reduce mission chief turnover may be warranted. There's also much scope to strengthen the fund's lending framework to better address the needs and vulnerabilities of small developing states. Through the advocacy of like-minded small developing states chairs and the hard work of UMA and many other staff members, the board made a positive step with the recent approval of the Resilience and Sustainability Trust. The RST, for short, is a welcomed mechanism to channel concessional resources to help small developing states build resilience especially to climate change and we want to make certain that it accomplishes it does accomplish this goal i believe that the fund must be vigilant from the outset to engage effectively with small developing states to encourage access if the uptake among these countries falls below expectations the imf staff and board should consider options to adjust following the initial operalization of the rst we also need to work to maximize the rst's catalytic impact Accessing climate financing has proven very challenging for many small developing states. The RST, combined with fund initiatives to identify opportunities in public investment institutions and processes to build low carbon and climate resilience infrastructure, can ideally make a meaningful difference in leveraging climate financial financing from other institutions and the private sector. In this context, it will be important at the planned 18-month interim review take stock of whether the RST is meeting its objectives, including for small states. And if not, what tweaks and changes would need to be made to ensure that the RST is having the intended impact. But more work remains. The significant scale of the shocks small uh, to small and vulnerable countries face relative to the size of their economies and fund quotas is vast. And there are opportunities to strengthen immediate support when disasters strike. One way to do this is by increasing access under the natural disaster window of the emergency financial facilities 
for small quota countries with sound macroeconomic frameworks. A successful 16th general review of quotas would also helpfully boost members' access to fund financing. This is especially important for small developing states given their significant needs. Relatedly, the evaluation found that the uptake of upper credit tranche programs by small developing states remains low. We have often questioned why this is the case and the IEO report aptly outlined the diverse reasons for this as expressed by the authorities. Some of these include low access levels relative to financial needs, the administrative burden associated with applying and going through the process, and the focus on adjustment rather than growth related outcomes. It is very important that these findings are used to shape the USD programs into products better fit to the use of our small state membership. As I conclude, I want to once again commend staff on the progress made in strengthening fund engagement with small developing states and offer a few considerations as the fund maps out the course for further improving engagement with small developing states. The challenges of small developing states are significant. Some are longstanding, such as the lack of economic diversification and exposure to natural disasters. Some are new or relatively new, such as the impact of Russia's invasion in Ukraine and, and the pandemic. And some are growing in importance, such as the shocks from climate events. These challenges point to the need for continuous enhancements to bilateral surveillance, capacity building and lending to make an impact and appropriately address the specific circumstances facing countries. Experience has shown me that the fund is up to the challenge and the evaluation clearly recognizes the importance of progress that has been made. I also see day to day and in discussions by the board, the commitment of the IMF as an organization in meeting this challenge. I believe the staff management and the board share the joint goal of finding opportunities to strengthen engagement in small developing states and providing them with optimal support to help address ongoing and unexpected challenges with the ultimate goal to build a path towards sustainable resilience and inclusive growth. I trust that we can continue this work together to, to meeting those objectives. I'll stop here and thank you again for the invitation to participate and thank everybody for participating in the seminar. Thanks very much, Philip. I think you very nicely recognized the true value added that is being provided already, but also give some some good suggestions about uh, going forward, how to, how to further uh, strengthen the, the impact of, of the fund's work. And this provides a perfect segue to Uma, our, our last panelist. Uh, Uma has worked extensively on, on small states uh, in the country context and, and then now more recently in, in SVR where she, she oversees the overall uh, approach to working on small states. Um, I think Uma has you know, recognized through the fund and also in, in, in the small states themselves as, as a real champion uh, of the work on small states with the strong commitment. So I'm really looking forward to hearing Uma's uh, thoughts here uh, about achievements, challenges, and, and, and directions to, to further strengthen the, the fund's work on small states. Uma, please. Thank you, Charles. Very kind introduction. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you also for having me here, um, esteemed panelists. Thank you for um, uh, having me. I want to first congratulate the IEO for a very detailed, extensive and deep uh, report with impressive amount of work has gone into it. So uh, my congratulations to you for uh, the great report. Um, I want to just focus on three key areas and you know, a lot has already been said. So a little bit of granularity to um, uh, to sort of set the stage from staff standpoint. Um, so the first area would be on the common vision that we share with the IEO. So I want to um, note that, you know, we share the same sentiment that um, with the IEO that our engagement with um, small states has improved a lot. Our engagement with small states, they are a very critical fund stakeholder for whom institutional commitment by staff, by management, by the board has been um, um, has been scaled up significantly, and we will continue to strive to do that as we go forward. That's the commitment I make. Um, 
Now, the institution, we are keenly aware of the constraints and challenges faced by small states, and they are unique, and their challenges are unique. And the IEO report provides an excellent stock take of the uniqueness of the small states and what the IMF has done and what could be done better as we go forward. And we welcome those uh, those recommendations. Um, so the you know like like in anything and like um, Philip just said you know we are a learning institution we have done well which is great what is it that we can do to do better to serve that uh, uh, those stakeholders um, in the in the membership so with that um, you know I want to just get into a little bit of granularity and I do think that the recommendations that the IO evaluation has would provide a good platform. Um, for us to take forward um, in terms of uh, the MIP and the actions that could be that would be needed to address some of these uh, recommendations. But a little bit of stock taking on what we have achieved uh, over the last decade, a little bit more granularity. Cyrus gave a very nice overview. So just going through the three pillars of the IMF, which is surveillance, CD, capacity development, and lending. Um, you know, I have spent more than 20% of my IMF career on small states, so I'm hands on familiar with what we have uh, done. And I can say with a high level of confidence that we have, um, we care deeply and we have um, allocated a lot of resources to help um, small states and to serve the region better. Um, in addition to tailored country engagement, the institution has tried to develop surveillance and policy advice, taking into account the macrostructural challenges that are faced by the region, their uniqueness, the resilience that is needed to climate change, developing tools to help with climate change. You know, first we had the CCPA, which was mentioned in uh, Cyrus's presentation, um, and now we have switched to CMAPs. You know, the CCPA, for various reasons that I will not get into, morphed into the CMAP. Debt management issues, providing support on a series of workshops on correspondent banking issues. So, you know, we've been engaging with them on granular issues that the region has been facing, which through time has, we would hope, helped them. And we have also been showcasing more lately the CBDCs, the central bank digital currency, and uh, supporting the countries that have moved in that direction, such as Bahamas, such as the ECCB, such as Jamaica, and we have been showcasing the reason why uh, for those countries it will be beneficial, financial inclusion, improvement in the payment system, etc. So, you know, so we help and we showcase where we see that there are uh, gains that have been made. In capacity development, 14% of the total CD spending, capacity development spending in the institution went in FY 2021 went to small states. And with the spending doubling, from a decade ago. So that's, I think, significant progress. And we are providing capacity development in core areas like debt, national accounts, fiscal, financial sector, risk management, and now on climate change. Um, you know, so the spectrum, it covers the whole spectrum of issues that the fund deals with. That said, it is not to say that we have covered all the capacity issues and fully recognize that many of these constraint, countries are capacity constrained. And there is certainly more work to do, and it is something that we would um, look forward to in the discussion that we have in the separate evaluation that has come for review on the uh, capacity development in the fund um, by the IEO. So that would be an opportunity to discuss that further. Um, turning to lending, um, the heterogeneity of small states implies varying needs, and our financing has varied depending on the needs of the member. I would highlight that the fi finding from the IEO that small states that went through fund programs, and Ian pointed to this also, actually did better relative to other countries. And some of the countries that went through IMF programs like Barbados, Jamaica, Grenada, came in, uh, were able to do better during the crisis because they had the buffers having gone through the adjustment and they were able to release some of those buffers or use some of those buffers for the uh, during the pandemic. and you know, to the extent they can in the current um, food fuel crisis also. Um, so the so that's one thing. And then the so what that to me implies also is that when Caribbean countries take on a reform program, they own it and they they take it to the extent they can in order to successfully complete uh, the reforms that they choose that they commit to undertake. But from a broader toolkit standpoint, we also have given special treatment to many small and micro states by giving 19 out of the 34 small states access to concessional financing in the PRGT, even if their income levels may be 
higher than the cutoff for your typical low-income PRGT country. And uh, also to add that 16 out of the 34 small states had access to emergency financing during the pandemic and five programs were augmented also. Um, the uh, small states received two and a half billion during the SDR allocation and the large natural disaster window during the pandemic when the access levels were increased. The disaster window um, when, um, access level was also increased from 80 to 130 percent of quota. So, you know, we are doing what we can in the context of uh, lending to make sure that we are able to support the countries. And I would turn to the RST because, you know, it's something that I'm coming fresh out of working on very closely. And for the RST, we made sure that every small state that is vulnerable is included in the qualification and in the eligibility. And we made the income cutoff 25 times the PRGT IDA threshold in order to make sure that small states that are vulnerable are included in the eligibility. Um, and we did not want the income um, per capita income to be a, a factor that will sort of keep out some of the richer small states. And I would also add that having led the SPR work on this front, it was not an easy um, outcome to achieve. It took a lot of had, um, you know, discussions and um, how do we how do we actually get there? And from st even within staff, we had to have a lot of discussions and of course with the board in order to make that happen. But you are, we are very happy that we landed where we landed. So that's I think also to show that we take special care of our small state members. Um, and just to also give a little bit of background to provide, you know, so that there is an understanding of where the RST came from. The, the precursor to the RST was a discussion we were having with the shareholders on a small states trust when the pandemic um, came upon us. This was in 2020. Um, while there was a lot of interest and, you know, understanding that small states needed some special care because tourism had collapsed completely, um, you know, so they were isolated and their economic revenue, etc., were, you know, totally decimated. Um, so while there was a lot of understanding of what was going on, we were not able to garner the support needed to create the trust. And so when I went into the RST, that was the background with which we went into creating the RST where we had more the small states trust into something like the RST that would be able to take on some of the challenges that the small states face. So that's the sort of genesis of where the RST came from was from the small states. And of course, it became what it became through various discussions. So the challenges and priorities going ahead, you know, a lot has been said, and I won't repeat many of these things. On the on the HR challenges, you know, these having been the division chief of a Caribbean division for you know more than five years, I totally get that. And I I have a lot of empathy for the frustration that shareholders might face and our counterparts in the countries might face. Um, we would need to think about how to address that. We need to, of course, balance air, you know, priorities and the demands on resources with what is realistic and what is feasible. And that would be how we would approach the MIP in terms of, um, you know, how do we move forward? Uh, we all want to certainly make sure that any framework that we build uh, is agile and flexible to be able to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, so we hope that our engagement um, uh, will address all the aspects that have been raised by the IEO. And with that in mind, uh, the management implementation plan to address the recommendations would anchor the, the direction for the work that we hope to take on uh, small states work as we go forward. And we are highly committed, no question about that. I personally am very committed to work constructively with the IEO, the board, the evaluation committee, um, with, with stakeholders and with staff. And because we need to make sure that we are able to um, bring the right balance and we are able to use the resources in the most efficient way possible. Um, so we will continue to work with you closely on that. Um, so we do expect that there would be an updated SDS note that will guidance note that will take on some of the recommendations that the um, IEO has presented. Um, and it will be an opportunity for us to take on board the developments that have happened since the pandemic. You know, a lot has changed. What do we need to revisit? There is a new, new debt sustainability module on climate change. You know, how do we incorporate that? 
the RST implementation, you know, how do we, um, you know, we have reviews that will have to take into account the experience, not just on small states, but the broader experience also. And CD related issues, we will have to re So, you know, we are committed to looking at all these aspects uh, to make sure that we address them to the satisfaction of all sites. Um, and we will want to focus on strengthening the con uh, and continuity of our engagement to be as effective as we can um, as we go forward. So with that, I'm happy to respond to any questions and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Uma. That was, that was very helpful. And uh, you know, I, I liked your emphasis on the, the RST because I, mean, I, I agree that could really be a game changer uh, in the sense of providing a an instrument for the fund to provide additional concessional resources with long duration and attractive uh, interest rates to address you know the very serious problems that many small states face in the area of of, of climate resilience so I I really look forward to to strong implementation with with the with the small states of, of this of this new initiative which you know it's, it's very recent so we, we didn't we didn't have the opportunity to evaluate it in the in our evaluation, but certainly extremely important. Um, so we, we have uh, around ten minutes uh, for any uh, Q and A, and I, I see I've got a couple uh, in the chat box already. Um, maybe I can uh, summarize these two, and and please send further further questions as as they occur to you. Uh, first question from from Chris Becker, who is very interested in what Ian was saying about the uh, CDP's work on the recovery duration adjuster. Uh, his interest in applying this to the Pacific Islands, um, and he asked the question um, if Ian could expand on the possible inadequacies of of GNI per capita as a measure of wealth and access as population. Uh, Become very small, and perhaps sort of an additional angle to this is the point that he, that Ian made about um, not focusing just on GDP, but also on on vulnerability as, as potentially providing access, increased access for concessional funds. And it, it was interesting what what Uma said about the efforts that had been made by fund staff to make sure that in fact all small states were uh, eligible for for the RST, uh, so I mean, clearly this is is concerned. I'm, I'm not sure there's a an easy way of of resolving it. So I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in in comments from Umar on that. Um, and then there's a question from from Miguel uh, Las Casas, who worked on the evaluation, um, who asks about the the issue of of the extent of trust um, in the relationship. Between small states and and the fund, um, and you know whether the CDP experience and CDP is located in the region has much has very close relations with the countries. You know, are, are there further things that the uh, uh, fund could do, drawing on the CDP's lessons uh, in the region to, to to further strengthen trust and to and to make sure that the trust is 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 you know. Um, uh, felt in 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 all the countries and not not just in a few countries. Uh, so maybe to turn to Ian first, and then maybe Uma would like to add some comments as well. And and Philip. Um, so turning first to Ian. So thanks for those questions. Uh, let me start with the recovery duration adjuster. Uh, we are still um, working on this. This is intended to be a universal, to have universal application, so it can be pretty much applied to uh, to any country. Uh, the recognition here, though, and I mentioned uh, three things. I mentioned the probability of a shock. I mentioned the size of the impact and the duration of the impact. And those things are, you know, the things that sort of separate or or, or determine. Um, the impact uh, of a of a shock. So 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 there's the probability, and I guess you know 
the probability of a uh, natural hazard event, for example, affecting um, the Bahamas or Florida or Dominica uh, might be similar. Uh, the size of the impact differs, however, and the duration of the impact. And those are the things that we are trying to uh, that we are trying to incorporate. So, so uh, the recognition is that if you look forward, let's say for argument's sake, over ten years, uh, and you apply uh, these parameters, inclusive, of course, of the resilience of of the countries, then you are going to see uh, 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 a shape of the, um, if you like, the time the the time series of the forecasted time series of GNI is going to look different uh, than let's say you if you project it at this point given you know given the absence of a, of a shock. Uh, and what we are doing is that we are trying to apply that difference, the difference between what what would obtain in the absence of a shock or a natural hazard event, um, compare that with with what would likely happen if you uh, apply the probability of a shot and the likely size of impact and the duration of, of impact and use that difference, that ratio to adjust the, uh, the GNI. So you're basically saying, look, uh, yes, this country might have uh, a GNI today, but we are aware that uh, over the course of 10 years, you might have one or, or two shocks that seriously affect um, seriously affect the countries. Uh, if you look at if you look at the the time series of real GDP for um, some of our some of our countries, uh, Barbados never recovered to its real GDP level uh, in two thousand and eight uh, at the time when it was affected by COVID. So the point is that today, Barbados has still not gotten back to the level of real GDP that existed in, in 2008, right? Uh, when you look at other small states, on average, that is, that is not the situation, right? So, so we are trying to incorporate those things uh, into the use of GNI as a basis for determining access to concessional resources. On, on the issue of trust, I think that I think that um, I think that there's there's a clear improvement in trust uh, in the region generally. Uh, there are still situations where political economy uh, considerations may affect the eagerness, if you like, of countries to approach the fund for, for programs. Uh, but there's a recognition that, that the fund has changed its modus operandi and it is, it is more appreciative of, of the, the specific context um, of, uh, of the small states of the Caribbean, as well as more appreciative of the need to to, to operate, let's say, at a, a, a high level in terms of uh, the key macroeconomic indicators, but rather allow the countries to, to uh, make determinations on how those particular um, targets, those overarching targets will be achieved um, based on structure of the economy, based on the political economy um, issues, and so on. So I think that 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 MO has improved the 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 level of trust in the region, and of course, success always helps as well. And uh, what has been achieved by Jamaica, what has been achieved by Grenada, uh, uh, Uma added to the the point that I made on on the 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 fact that when these when these countries were went into COVID, they had more significant buffers. Um, Jamaica, during the course of their program, has really managed to 
uh, managed to become far more resilient, far more competitive. It has manifested itself in, if you unpack uh, GDP, the headline GDP growth might not be stellar, but when you unpack the growth, you can see that the fundamentals are being built. The country is becoming, uh, has become more competitive. Uh, exports uh, in real terms have grown as a result of that competitiveness, and there's been uh, a certain level of diversification as, as a result of that. Um, and of course, there are the, the buffers that were built, certainly as far as the reserves are concerned. And Grenada is the same thing. So, so success has, has helped as well with the trust together with, with uh, you know, a, a more customized uh, and, and human approach, humane approach to, to um, crafting policy approaches as part of the programs. Uh, thanks very much, Ian, and thank you again for participating today. Um, we're, we're we're drawing close to the to the finishing time. We, we may go over it by a few minutes, uh, but I'd like to give Uma, Philip, and, and Cyrus a, a chance for some final thoughts as well. Uh, Uma, and reactions to the questions that have been raised on on the use of GNI per capita. Uh, the issue of trust, and then I, I see John Hicklin has, has an additional question uh, on RST conditionality and how the, the authorities and the IMF will determine the policies will be sufficient to achieve progress to resilience. So, Uma. Thank you, Charles. Um, so, just to add to what Ian just said on the trust factor, uh, you know, I do think that engaging with countries and, um, you know, which we do a lot in terms of recognizing what are their what are the needs on the ground? Um, and I think customizing our approach is what has really mattered. Um, so I think we we have come a long way, um, but you know we are at the end of the day a lending institution with conditionality, and conditionality creates political economy issues. And so I don't think we can completely get rid of um, the so-called stigma forever, or uh, you know completely get it out. But I think in terms of engaging with countries, we need to be we need to be practical and realistic also in how we uh, approach our uh, our engagement on the lending side on the um, on the gni per capita yeah so in the rst we did end up there but it's not because we didn't try other things we in fact we started out looking at vulnerability indicators um, because originally we thought this would only be a um, climate trust and then it has evolved into you know broadening the structural challenges so um, Looking at climate vulnerabilities alone would not have um, would not have been sufficient for the purposes, the challenges that the trust will try to address. Um, and the second part of it is that for us, we need, given the membership is much broader, uh, we need to see objective criteria that will run across the whole membership. So, and the data coverage for many of these vulnerabilities are either not even or are not necessarily reliable. And the, the frequency of getting these data are not, not, not necessarily there. So there are a number of data issues that from the IMF, the way we do our lending and we, we identify eligibility for countries, it is very difficult to rely on the sort of vulnerability data of disasters or other such um, indices to, um, to, to define what our eligibility will be. So we've had to go with objective criteria which are reliable World Bank data that we can use in order to uh, come up with such eligibility. So that's where we had to go in the end. But as a test, we map the countries that are eligible for the RST versus the vulnerability indicators that are available. And we had about a good 80% match of the countries that are um, eligible for the RST with the vulnerability. So it gave us some comfort that we are not completely off the mark. We have a pretty good mapping there. Um, let me stop there, Charles. Thanks very much, Uma. Uh, Philip, can I turn to you for some final thoughts? Sure. Yeah, I, I don't have too much to add to that, but uh, to what's been answered already, but just a few things. I, I guess to, just to recognize that there is quite a bit of work in different places on vulnerability indicators. Uh, so, the, you know, the Caribbean Development Bank was mentioned, but the, obviously the UN is doing some work, the Commonwealth. So I think there's a recognition that there is value in having some sort of, of uh, indicator. And I guess 
what I what I worry about or uh, am pleading for is at the end, ultimately, it'd be great if there could be some consensus towards a vulnerability index, because otherwise you may end up um, uh, constraining the possibilities of using it uh, if you end up having multiple different indicators that exist out there. So I guess it's just a plea that the more we can kind of, at the end of the day, learn from these different uh, indexes and, and really try to find some consensus together. Uh, I just think it will lead to better use of the indicators to begin with. And again, that's to achieve the goal, which I think everyone has in small developing states is that that you know gdp per capita is not you know necessarily the best tool to be uh, relying on to in terms of deciding where funds should go um on the uh, on the on the issue of of trust I'll, i guess i'll just say again this is based on you know relatively little time here but i've already mentioned that you know in some ways you know um, access to funding is related has to be related to somewhat is it worth it you know, and in some ways, you know, is there enough access? Is there is there kind of enough um, access to funding and, and financing uh, from the effort of kind of trying to access it? Is the administrative burden too too high? And there is uh, in in some countries a, a bit of a political overhang, I'd say, that does affect the interest in terms of uh, pursuing it. But I think the important thing is is that the fund has to continue its work that it's been doing. At the end of the day is to show that it is a partner that is willing to partner when countries are ready to uh, to engage and that there's a continuously kind of improvement in terms of how it engages so countries which i think are, are i'm seeing already are recognizing the imf has improved and the more that 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 kind of you know relationship can deepen over time then it will at some point uh, at least offer the opportunity uh, for a partnership to occur between the IMF um, and, and the countries. And to kind of in some ways uh, go back to what my thematic throughout, which is really that it's, it's kind of the commitment to continuously improve, which I think is important and is one that I've heard uh, by management, by staff and by the board, which I think will kind of hopefully get us to a deeper trust and at some point that will translate into um, relationships uh, that uh, allow a, a better access to the tools we have available at the IMF. Thanks very much, Philip. So let me turn to, to Cyrus for, for a final word. Thanks very much, Charles, and to the participants, um, panelists, participants, everyone who's joined this meeting. Um, from my side, firstly, I must say I've greatly valued the opportunity to share the findings of the evaluation. Um, as I said, it's a team effort and the colleagues who put this together are all mainly here. Um, this is a credit to the work that you've done. I want to thank um, Uma, Philip and Ian. I really found your, com your comments very, very insightful and helpful. Uh, it's a pity we didn't start our evaluation without a, a a session like this because you actually pointed to a whole range of pathways that could have enriched the evaluation further. I do want to end on a particularly positive note given the contributions that have been made by the three panelists. I think there are three big issues coming out of this session, uh, at least those that strike me. The first is that the platform on which the next phase of the fund's engagement with small states is proceed is really very strong. I think we've heard it uh, from the panelists. Uh, I think the findings that we came up in the evaluation about the rich work that the fund is doing across such a diverse area in such a complicated field. I don't want to underplay this issue of complication of working on small cities. It's very complicated, hard work under difficult conditions. Um, but that platform is very strong. Um, and I would say that, that that's for someone who's been running with an evaluation for quite a period of time. Um, that's really nice to hear because uh, it's not always that an IEO evaluation can really say that candidly, that the platform on which all of this work is being done is really very robust. Staff are working extremely hard uh, on small states work. In fact, a point I made sometime earlier in another presentation is that as the MIP gets uh, 
rolled out, um, attention will need to be given to the impact that uh, on staff morale as more work is loaded on or more complex work is loaded on. Um, uh, it, I think it will be important to, to take account of the, the impact on staff already doing a lot of work in difficult circumstances. But the platform itself is extremely strong. It means that it all frankly very, very well for the engagement of this group of countries, say, the next decade. Um, second is that the opportunities to progress and develop a strong MIP really came out powerfully for me. And again, um, you can imagine the team that has been participating, and myself as well, very much welcome all of this. And there were comments made about the opportunity to deepen the surveillance toolkit to refine it. Uh, Uma has made a number of points about how these certain aspects of the toolkit are, are shifting, changing, adapting, strengthening. Um, this is tremendous to hear. Um, uh, the recognition about the, the opportunity, the challenges, but also the opportunity to strengthen HR engagement and strengthen incentives. These are doable. These are achievable although they're difficult to, to achieve. The opportunities to widen and push out the, the gains that have been made in capacity development. I think we've heard lots of elements of this. And so I think the opportunity for, the, for an MIP, there's some nice green lights flashing there and I think there's good opportunity. And of course, under all of this, it's the will uh, of management and staff, which has been apparent right throughout our evaluation, but now at the end of it through uh, the points Uma has made. Um, there's that. There's a will there. There's a strong determination to build an even more solid foundation. That's that comes out strongly from. Me. And then finally, um, unlike any other time, I think I've concluded my comments on in a small states context. And Charles mentioned I've worked on small states for years now. Finally, there are some game changers on the horizon, or have actually come and uh, come, come right in front of us. But one of these in the fund context and fund engagement is the RST. I think Philip raised this, Uma raised it, Ian has pointed to it. It's truly a game changer. For so many years, small states have spoken about their need for longer facilities with a longer duration, um, the ability to apply conditionality in programs in a more moderated way, in a way that addresses their challenges and, and keeps in step with the Kind of constraints that they face so that if they can comply with the conditions, they can make progress and can go through another virtuous round. The RST is arriving. I think the architecture of it, Philip's point about getting it right at the beginning and making making sure that uh, it's it's crafted well at the outset is very, very important, but it's, it's a super opportunity, super, super opportunity. There are other aspects that have been raised as well, which are, I think, um, in some sense, game changers. It's the absolute burst of innovation that's taking place around engaging with small states, not only at the fund, but with development partners. There's an opportunity for the fund to leverage on this and to share the innovation that's coming from the research agenda of the fund and from the recalibration of the toolkit. So that's, there's that as well. And then Thirdly, I, I see already a very strong uptick in collaborative efforts between the fund, but also among development partners, particularly regionally focused. And again, I think this is a game changer. We talk at the fund of a catalytic role. We re usually mean the fund's catalytic role in country, but there's a catalytic role that the fund and others may be able to play in crowding more member countries into a a collective endeavor, collective step, including program engagement with the fund. And I see all of this starting to drift onto the horizon. I heard quite a lot of it through the, the discourse today. So very positive myself, um, quite sad to hand over in a sense because evaluation is now at an end, but looking forward to see how the M MIP uh, gets crafted and set set. Thank you. Thanks very much to Cyrus and thanks to all of our panelists for really useful, insightful and you know, quite passionate and committed uh, comments. You know, we've, 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 we've run over time and that I think reflects the fact that you, know, that you, you all have a, a lot to say. You've thought about 
challenges of these countries, what the fund can do very hard. And, and uh, I think that, that bodes well for, for, for the future of the relationship between the fund and, and small states. I'll just uh, remind you that if you'd like to see more of the evaluation, you can see it on our, our website. We'll also be posting the recording of this uh, uh, seminar on, on our website. Um, and we ourselves look, look forward to the, the next stage, um, the implementation plan. And, and here, as Cyrus suggests, we're, we're basically pass, passing the ball to, uh, to staff and management and, and, and the board, but we'll obviously be, be following very carefully and, and doing what we can uh, to um, uh, make sure we, we end up with a, with a, a good implementation plan. Uh, so that, that we, with that, we reached the end of the session. Thanks to all of, all of our audience as well for, for joining. Um, and uh, you know, we, we appreciate your interest in the work. And uh, we will continue to follow uh, the progress with, with small states, but, but also more, more generally we'll be uh, continuing to, to bring interesting topics to our seminar program and hope to see uh, many of you in future sessions. So with that, let me say goodbye and, and hope to see you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again.